Amen. Never get tired of singing that. Well, I am. Uh, I'm very excited for tonight to be able to share with you all what God has been doing through our sister church there in Radosh, and uh, I, I want to share one thing with you now this morning uh, concerning the refugees, which I think are the primary thing that's been on our mind and our in our prayers for them. Uh, we'll share more about the refugees and what they've been doing, but uh, one of the pastors told me, was one of the first things he told me was thank you for all the monies that uh, we as a church and other Texas churches uh, have come together to send them, uh, and he, he wanted us to know, he said, we're trying to fuel them, and you fueled us, is the way that he put it, uh, so they were extremely blessed by, uh, by you and by what our other churches collected to enable them to do the ministry. It was a very, very important ministry. Uh, while refugees are starting to go home or, or they're moving to other places and starting to get settled, uh, at the, the peak, the, that little church had about 160 refugees that they were taking care of. Uh, it's, again, it's a congregation of about 50 members. And uh, one thing that, that really impressed me and, and just proved what a vital work it was, uh, was all the different religions that came into their campus. They told us, you know, of course you had Catholic, you had Orthodox, you had a Protestant, but they even had uh, Muslim refugees come into their church uh, to be ministered to. And uh, what the pastor told me, he kept using the word testimony, that it was a good testimony for the church. He said that the Muslims in particular, although the others were, were amazed by it, too, but the Muslims were amazed as they came into this church that they would be so loved on and cared for by these Christians. And it, just, it just blew them away. And, and so, you know, whatever those people do with the gospel, they, they heard and saw the gospel in a very tangible way. And they were, they were baffled by it and amazed that these Christians would show them in a time of great tribulation and trial for them would show them such mercy and love. But it was a testimony to them to share with them that we do this because we know the God whose mercies are new every morning. And so while our funds helped them to be able to do it financially, it was God who continued to fuel them day in and day out with his love and mercy that they might be able to share with those in their trials, the mercy of God. I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is uh, the, uh, the end times chapter. We started this a few weeks ago, uh, and we're going to continue going through it uh, together. But we're going to be talking about tribulation this morning. Tribulation. Uh, we all experience tribulation in various ways, at various levels. We all experience tribulation. This morning as we look to this passage, we're going to, to be reminded that when we experience tribulation, we have a hope as Christians that will not disappoint. When we experience tribulation, we can hope for the mercy of God and we can know that we will receive that mercy through the gift of His Son, Jesus. So as we prepare for this uh, passage this morning, I invite you to pray with me and to ask God to give us eyes that we'll see. Almighty God, we praise you that you are good and that you have shared your goodness with us. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence here this morning, and I pray that our songs were pleasing to you and that our hearts were humble before you. You are worthy of honor and glory and power, and dominion and praise. And you are worthy now to be glorified before us this morning through your word. We turn to your living word this morning and ask that you would divide us, that you would penetrate, cut through, and get to the very heart of who we are, that you would reveal to us that heart, that we might surrender it to you, and be changed. Lord God, please guide us now through your word that we might know you more. It's in Jesus' name and for your glory that we pray. Amen. 
Matthew chapter 24, last time we were here a few weeks ago, we began this chapter, Jesus has finished his woes against the religious leaders, and he has promised them that they are about to be judged, and that their house is going to be left to them desolate. And as they have left the temple, uh, the disciples are looking at the beautiful buildings, and the temple that Herod in particular had remodeled was, was extraordinarily beautiful, ornate, and glorious. And they're like, Jesus, look at all these magnificent buildings. And Jesus told them, <laughs> uh, yeah, look at them. These are buildings that are doomed for destruction. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. And, and the disciples, they asked Jesus, when is this going to happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And what's going to be the sign of the end, the sign of your coming? And it's these questions that Jesus is addressing uh, in these two chapters, 24 and 25. The destruction of the temple and the, and the end of all things. And it's these chapters that are probably the most debated and argued over in Christianity today uh, when it comes to the Gospel of Matthew as we wrestle over the question of the end times. Last time we saw that Jesus said to the disciples that when you see the destruction of the temple, that's not the end of all things. It's merely the beginning, birth pangs, and there's more to come. And he said, you need to be ready because life is going to get tough. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars, famine, earthquakes. But he also said that there's going to be the spread of the gospel. The gospel is going to be proclaimed to all nations. The end cannot come until these things take place. And now he's going to begin to address further uh, their questions in more detail. This passage we're about to read, it, there's a lot of controversy over it. Uh, the question is really, did Jesus, uh, was he talking about the destruction of the temple by the Romans in AD 70? Or is he talking about some future temple that's going to be rebuilt and destroyed by the Antichrist later? Uh, and we're going to walk through this briefly because I don't want to get caught up too much in these elements. Uh, but I do want to just go ahead and say that we need to be careful as Christians that we do not speak with confidence on things that we really should not, uh, that we're, it's just not that clear. In other words, uh, we need to be confident about the things that are clear and gracious about those elements of Scripture that we're still just waiting to see how it's going to play out. And there's one thing that we can be clear about, that no matter what happens in this world, and no matter how difficult it is, and it will be, Jesus is coming back. Praise the Lord. Let's be ready. Amen. All right, so let's get into these controversial passages together. Verse 15 of Matthew 24. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But, here's the key. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now again, scholars debate over this in the church. There's a debate over it uh, of what Jesus is talking about here. Whether he's talking about some end time uh, destruction of the temple, great, the great tribulation as we normally think of it, the seven year period in which the Antichrist arises. Uh, others think that Jesus is talking about the coming destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD when the Romans uh, besieged the city for several years. And when they broke through the walls, the devastation that they wrought on that city was absolutely horrendous. If you go and read the Jewish historian Josephus, uh, mothers eating their own children during the siege. And when the Romans broke through the walls, uh, they spared uh, hardly uh, anyone, there was just abundant death and destruction. And some people believe 
uh, that that's what Jesus is talking about. But the first thing that he does is that he, he, he names this abomination of desolation. If you go back into the prophecy of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel in several places, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 12, he mentions this abomination of desolation. Uh, and we don't really know what this is, what Daniel meant by it, what exactly Jesus means by it. Again, there are lots of views. But the abomination itself, it, it's a word that means something that is disgusting and vile. And as a disgusting and vile thing or person, it causes desolation. It causes destruction. So there are a lot of vile things in our world that cause destruction. But Daniel speaks of a specific abomination of desolation. And Jesus says, when you see it, when you see this abomination of desolation that Daniel talked about, standing in the holy place, if you ever read Letter Bible, the words let the reader understand, uh, more than likely are not read, but probably Jesus is still speaking here, saying, let those who read Daniel understand, when you see this happening, that Daniel's prophecy is taking place. And so when you see this abomination, desolation, standing where he should not, standing in the holy place, you need to understand that prophecy is being fulfilled. And the re response, he says, is you got to run. <laughs> you got to flee. Those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. If you're on the housetop, don't go down. Jump off the house and run away. Don't worry about your stuff. Uh, if you're in a field, don't go back to get your cloak. You need to get out of there. It's like... Like in Genesis 19, when Lot is being brought out of Sodom and Gomorrah, saying, judgment is coming, you have to flee, don't look back. There is no time to look back. If you look back, you will be swept away in destruction. That's the same uh, kind of um, intensity and, and urgency that Jesus says we need to have uh, when this takes place. You need to run. He says, woe to those who are pregnant and nursing because it's very difficult to travel when you're in that situation or in the winter time or even in the, on the Sabbath when people are going to restrict your travel if you're a Jew. So he says that the, this time is coming and when it's coming you need to understand that prophecy is being fulfilled and that death is close by. Now, I, I personally think that he's probably talking about the temple being destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. If you go back and you see the disciples, that's their question. When is the temple going to be destroyed? Uh, you see the, that geographic note about Judea. It's not really a worldwide tribulational idea that we see in Revelation. The Sabbath concept really doesn't bother us Gentiles. We'll travel all day on <laughs> Saturday. It doesn't bother us. But even more than that, Christians in Jerusalem, when the Romans started besieging the city, probably 68, 69 AD, they looked at what Jesus has said and they said, the Romans are here, the abomination of desolation is here, and the Christians actually abandoned Jerusalem uh, when all of that took place so they wouldn't be there when the destruction came. But however you, you, you want to see this, it's an event that is not going to be secret, it's a, a, a tribulation and a suffering that's going to be evident. And he says, if you're paying attention, you're going to see it. And when you see it, this is how you need to respond to it. He says, then there's going to be a great tribulation. We talk a lot about the great tribulation in the American church, but it's only used a few times in the Bible, and this is one of them. He says that uh, this tribulation... Uh, has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And some people believe that this is so extraordinary that it can't be anything less than the very end of all time when the Antichrist is destroying all things. Other people believe that the destruction of Jerusalem was so horrifying that it's unparalleled in history. And then other people believe that when he gets to verse 21, he's no longer talking about verse, what's happening in verses 15 through 20. That he's talking about uh, a period of tribulation in which uh, the destruction of the temple is merely the beginning of a very bad time. Remember last time, I know it's been a few weeks, but let's go back and read it. He says in verse 4 of chapter 24, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will he be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened. Those things must take place. But it's not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pain. So some people think that when Jesus in verses 15 through 
20 is talking about this tribulation, this destruction, abomination, desolation. He's talking about what happens with the destruction of the temple. But that's just the beginning. That we're about to be ushered into a time of intense tribulation in which there is persecution, which there is deception, in which there is pain and suffering. And I just want to say whatever you view, your view is about it, that the Bible is very clear that tribulation is a part of the Christian life. Paul says over in Acts 14, it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. Tribulation is a fact of life for Christians. That's a fact of life for everybody because the world's just broken and messed up. But as Christians, we have a very specific trial and tribulation that comes on us and we need to be aware of it. We need to expect it. And in expecting it, we need to remember what our hope is. Verse 22, Jesus says, unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Though this word elect, it means somebody who is chosen. Earlier in Matthew, Jesus said, many are called, few are chosen. It refers to those who believe in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the elect of God. And here's what's so beautiful is Jesus is going through this. I don't care what your views are in the end times and on this passage. As Jesus is going through all this bad stuff's happening. He says, it's going to be so bad that if something doesn't happen, all life is going to be wiped out. But something does happen. God steps in and he intervenes and he brings about a cutting short of this tribulation for the sake of his people. No matter how bad it gets, at some point, God will step in and show mercy to his people. Like in the days of Noah, if you remember in Genesis 6, like the world is just mad. If you think the world's bad now, the world is horrible. Everybody was killing each other, sleeping with each other, and just destroying all of God's creation. And God is so bad that God's going to wipe out all life. But then God intervenes with his own plan. He intervenes and he finds Noah and he says, but I will have mercy on Noah and his family. I will save Noah and his family. And humanity is rescued because God has mercy in the midst of his judgment. Tribulation is is part of life. Now, for everybody, there's, you know, there's sickness that happens, cancers that take place, bodies break. For everybody, there's relational problems, marriages that fail, kids that go haywire, your neighbors that drive you nuts. These things are just part of life. Tribulation happens. But as a Christian, we have a very specific tribulation in which we find ourselves as enemies of the world, yet still living in the world. You see, when you become a Christian, you change sides while still residing here. You become a child of light while still living in a dark world. And thus we are thrust into this tribulation in which deception is extremely prominent. Now, we may not be getting beheaded and thrown into prison. I guess I should reverse that. Thrown into prison and beheaded for our faith. But the Bible says that the, the primary threat to, to the church is not, is not violent persecution. The primary threat to the church is deception. And we are bombarded day after day after day with the lies of the enemy. We are bombarded day after day with these lies that tear down the truth, that call evil good and good evil. And we are constantly being pulled at, being tugged, being pushed, and being hounded by these lies until we finally give up and start embracing the lies and the madness. We are constantly being ostracized in our culture, in our community when we follow Jesus. And the only way we can make friends with the world is by distancing ourselves from Jesus. This is part of life, and it gets hard. But the beautiful 
message of our Father is that no matter how bad it gets, His mercy will step in when it's needed. No matter how bad it gets, God will intervene when it's time. And when you experience tribulation, and maybe you're going through some stuff right now and you're like, man, life is really tough. Or maybe you're a Christian who doesn't even realize that life is tough for you spiritually because you're so distracted by the world. Whatever you're going through, we need to remember that our hope is in the mercy of God and that our God is faithful to give it to his people. He may not step in and have mercy on the rest of the world, although he certainly does that plenty. But Christian, he will step in and show his mercy for you. So in tribulation, don't fret, don't worry. Hope in the mercy of God. Now this means that we have to wait. This means that we don't take it into our own hands and try to solve our own problems and get ourselves out of a difficult situation. If we're going to hope in God's mercy, then it means we have to wait on Jesus. Verse 23, if you'll continue along with me. He says, Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So, if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So Jesus, we, uh, we just read it, and, and he says it earlier in verse 5, verse 9, he's, uh, or 11, about the, the false prophets and the false messiahs, the people who will come up, and they will proclaim, they will declare that they have the way to life, that they have the solution to our problems, that they have salvation, and they will either play, proclaim that they have it themselves, or they will be false prophets saying, that person has it, you need to follow them. Now, when it says that they'll say that they're the Christ, this doesn't necessarily mean they're going to stand up and say, hey, I'm Jesus. The Christ is a title, and particularly in a Jewish Old Testament mindset, it's the title of the anointed one of God who brings salvation. And there are plenty of people who have not claimed to be Jesus who still claim to be sent by God to bring salvation to the world. You go through history, even today, there are all sorts of people who proclaim that God has set them up so that they can fix the problem, so that they can save the world. Jesus says, don't believe them. Don't believe them. There's only one who can fix the problem, only one who can save the world, and not any of these people. In fact, if they have to say it, if they have to tell you, I'm the Savior, they're not the Savior. Now here's the really cool thing about the second coming of Jesus. We're going to address this more detail next week. But the second coming of Jesus, you're not going to have to be told that it's happening. You're not going to have to get on Facebook and be like, oh man, somebody just posted Jesus came back. This is awesome. The second coming of Jesus is not going to be secret. And it's not going to be hidden. And nobody's going to have to tell you Jesus has come. You're going to know. That Jesus has come. In fact, all the world's going to know that Jesus has come. Not just the believers. It's not just that we're going to be caught up. It's that all the world is going to know. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. And those who have rejected Jesus are going to go into judgment. And those who have believed in Jesus will go into life. So he says these false Christs, false prophets are going to come. He says, don't believe them. Don't listen to them. They're going to mislead, if possible, even the elect, saying, Jesus says, they're going to show great signs and wonders. Now, this is, this is pretty astounding to me. I think in, in our American mindset, we kind of overlook supernatural. And we say it's a fraud. Other people, if they see supernatural, they say it must be of God. But here's the thing. Jesus says that these people legitimately are going to demonstrate miraculous powers. And, and there is a reality that in this world, there are people who do supernatural things. 
And just because they do supernatural things, just because you see spiritual things breaking out into the physical world, does not mean that they are from God. Does not mean that they belong to Jesus. In fact, this is why John says over in 1 John 4, test the spirits. Because somebody might be speaking to you from a spirit, but it's not the spirit of God. You need to be careful. And just because somebody comes on the scene and shows signs and wonders and is able to do miraculous things, that is not warrant for us to believe them. We believe them only if they conform to the word of God and the false prophets won't do that. And so Jesus says, I have told you in advance. And I think there's at least two reasons why he, he just goes ahead and says, I've already told you in advance. First of all, he's saying, pay attention. Look, if it takes us by surprise that somebody actually shows miraculous powers and leads people astray, we're not paying attention. If it takes us by surprise when somebody comes into our lives, tells us a nice pretty lie and it makes sense, and we end up forsaking Jesus because we believe the lie, we're not paying attention. Jesus says, I've told you so that you will pay attention. These things are coming so that you can be on your guard against deception. Again, the greatest threat to the church is not them breaking into this building and killing us because we're here to worship Jesus Christ. The greatest threat to the church is the lies and deceptions that they constantly hit us with. When he says mislead, if possible, even the elect, this doesn't mean that the elect can lose their salvation, although it is possible for the elect to be misled. Jesus, over in chapter 18 of Matthew, he talks about what happens when the elect get misled, that we're supposed to use church discipline to bring them back into the fold. So you can get misled as a Christian, maybe not into losing your salvation, but you can. But I don't think that's what he's trying to talk about here. He's saying that they're going to show these signs and wonders to mislead many, and, 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 and that their deception is not just aimed at the unbelievers, but they're also going to try the possibility of misleading the elect. In other words, Christians, their deception is not just for those outside the world. They actually target you and me as Christians. They want the church to be misled. This is our enemy that we're talking about. And I think one of the biggest flaws and failures of the American church is that we have become complacent thinking that we're safe. I think that's one of the greatest lies that we have heard in this church is that we are safe because we are America and America is Christian, Christian, Christian. But we're not safe because we are children of light who live in a dark world. We have an enemy who, like a roaring lion, is prowling around looking for somebody to devour. We are not safe. We are at war. And Jesus says, I've told you that we are at war. By the way, the other reason why Jesus says that is because uh, in the Old Testament, a prophet is only confirmed to be truly from God when his words come to pass. And so when we see all these things happening, we can look at Jesus and say, he is the truth. He is the prophet who is to come. He is the word of God. And we can believe Jesus and take him at his word because everything he said is going to happen has been happening and will continue to happen until all his words are fulfilled. He ends though with an interesting picture. He says, wherever the corpse is there, the vultures will gather. Vultures is probably a better translation than eagles as some of ours says. Uh, it's the idea, I mean, if you're driving down the road and you see a bunch of birds hovering over, pretty good chance there's something dead in the field or in the trees. Where the corpse is there, the vultures will gather. And scholars are divided over what this means. But if you look over in Revelation 19, we see kind of a similar uh, paralleling situation happening here in Revelation 19, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Jesus comes back. The bride has made herself ready. And then the chapter finishes with the coming back of Jesus with an invitation for the birds to gather to feast on the dead who have been judged by the returning king. So Jesus' coming is going to be evident to all. And for Christians, it's going to be a hallelujah, he's back, praise the Lord. But for unbelievers, it's going to be death. Jesus is coming back, but if we're not waiting for him, trusting in him and his return 
means our judgment. It's difficult to wait. In fact, waiting is one of the hardest things to do, especially if you're an impatient person like me. I was thinking about this the, uh, this weekend. We went to Dallas for a family birthday. And traveling into Dallas on Thursday, uh, rush hour traffic. Most annoying thing to me in, in traffic is when you're on a four-lane highway and three lanes are flying except the one you're sitting in. I don't know about you, that's just super annoying. So I'm sitting there, I'm in, I'm in the fast lane, I'm in the left lane. We're sitting there, stop, and all these people are just flying by. And I'm like, okay, enough of this. I see my opening, I hit the gas, I turn, I go into the fast lane that's flying, only to be greeted by brake lights. <laughs> Slam on the brakes. And all these people I just flew by just start slow, and, and they do it slowly to kind of rub it in. <laughs> if you thought you could get ahead, but they just slowly pass and they start moving. I'm like, man. If I stayed there, I'd be way up there. Okay, turn and turn signal on. Jump over into that lane up, taking off brakes. Now all these people start passing me. I did this for miles and miles, just being kind of irritated and impatient until finally after a few miles, I realized that the people that I had been behind when I started and was doing all this are now ahead of me because they just stayed in the lane. You know, life is difficult and you get impatient when things aren't happening the way you want. And so instead of waiting for God to do what God wants to do, you jump lanes thinking this is going to be better. This is going to be faster. This is going to get me where I want to be. But the danger of jumping out of Jesus' lane and trying to pursue lesser things than Jesus it said, everything but Jesus leads to death. Every lane goes to hell, but the lane that Jesus is in. And so we're called to wait. You know, we talked last week about all the bad things happening, and this week has been filled with more politicians talking about the same solutions that will never work. Talk about all these things that have to happen, that have to happen now. They've jumped out of Jesus' lane. They did that a long time ago and our culture is experiencing the destruction that comes from that. But have you jumped out of Jesus' lane? When tribulation comes and God does not start acting the way you want him to act and the timing you want him to act in, do you get impatient and say, forget this, these guys are moving over here, I'm going. See, Jesus is good. And Jesus is God. He not only knows the best thing to do, he's not only able to bring about the best for our lives, he's willing to do it for those who wait on him. But he's going to do it in his time, not ours. Which means when life gets tough, your job is not to say, Jesus, you have let me down. Your job is to say, Jesus, I'm waiting on you. And I can guarantee you when you wait on the Lord, you will not be disappointed. So what are you struggling with today? What tribulation are you experiencing today? Are you even awake enough to understand the onslaught against the church by an unbelieving world? We need to wake up to it and realize that we're in a fight but that fight is not going to be won by laws and restrictions. It's not going to be won by the solutions that I can come up with and give you. That fight's actually already been won. It was won by Jesus when he hung on the cross and he said it is finished. The fight that we're in, the war that we wrestle with, has already been won when Jesus walked out of the tomb alive. He's victorious. All we have to do is wait for him to bring that victory into our lives. And we serve a good God, my friends, who's merciful enough to bring it if we will simply trust and wait on Him. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank You for Your mercy. <laughs> I thank You, my God, that You have told us of the things that are to come before they come, that we might 
be ready, but that we also might rejoice in you that you are sovereign God. Help us, Lord, to be awake, to be alert, to be on guard against the lies of the enemy and the lies of the world and the lies our own heart tells us. Lord, I pray you'd sanctify us in the truth. And Lord, I pray that you would give us patience in our hearts and minds that we would not seek to take matters into our own hands when suffering hits, but that we would wait on you. Help us to be humble enough to have the faith needed to wait on you. Lord, please, please glorify yourself now as we respond to your word. I pray that you would do a work in our hearts and our minds for your name's sake. In your name I pray, amen. Mercy. Only God can save, and He only saves through Jesus Christ. I want to end with Paul's words from Romans 8. Paul asks this question. He says, What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? And this is, well, this is the Apostle Paul's who was a man well acquainted with tribulation, this is what he said. He said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know the love of God? Many are called, but few are chosen. And if you're here this morning, not a believer in Jesus Christ, rebelling against Him with your life, He is calling to you. But it's only through faith in Jesus that you experience the blessing of His salvation. He's already won the victory for us. His death on the cross is enough to cleanse you from whatever sins you've committed. And His resurrection is powerful enough to give you life. His mercy is there for those who would call out to Jesus. And if you need that this morning, when we stand and sing, call out to Jesus. My brother, my sister, listen to me. We need to wake up to the reality that we are in a war for our souls. If possible, to mislead the elect. Whatever your views are about these passages don't really matter. What matters is that this is happening now. And instead of taking matters into our own hands, we need to trust the Word of God and wait on Jesus to step in. And the fact that we don't do this is why we see families breaking apart within the church. The fact that we don't do this is why we see like all the mental health stuff we talk about and depression and all the bad things that happen in our world. We see all of that prevalent in the church which should find healing in Jesus. It, the fact that we split as churches over such mundane and foolish things shows that instead of waiting on the Lord, we come here with selfishness and bitterness in our hearts. Friends, we are constantly bombarded with lies trying to take us away from the truth of the Lord and the love of the Lord. My brother, my sister, should not be this way. We need to wake up. And we need to start letting God's word direct us. For his word is true. And it may mean that we have to wait a while for God to do the things that we want him to do. But all things are perfect in his time, not yours. Stand with me. Let's sing our song of invitation.